Okay, so welcome to the last session of the day. Um, we have Florian here, so uh, I think you can start immediately. Um, after this, we're going to have Domingo, so it's all yours. Yeah, okay, I see. <laughs> so uh, yesterday I was uh, between 40 people and their lunch, and uh, this time I'm, I'm, I think, between 60 people and their drinks, which is probably a more challenging position. Yes, <laughs> sure, I will. <coughs> okay, so um, this is the graveyard shift. This is the final talk of the day. Uh, and uh, I call this one the little bag of tricks, uh, 10 things you might not know that you can do with OpenStack. My name is Florian. Uh, I'm in charge of professional services and education at, at City Network. And in the past six or so years, I have helped people deploy uh, and operate and understand OpenStack. And this talk is about a few helpful, handy things that either you can already do with OpenStack, if you're an OpenStack user, or you can enable in your OpenStack environment if you're an OpenStack operator, thereby making your users' lives a little easier. Um, so chances are that the OpenStack cloud that you're either running or that you're interacting with can already do this or can be configured to do this, but still, over time, I've come to realize that there's rather a remarkable number of even experienced OpenStack users out there that may not know that these things exist or how to use them, so I'm here to change that. Um, so question number one, uh, if you are uh, just sampling uh, either public or, or private cloud OpenStack providers, that you just have API credentials to. Like, that's the only thing that you know about that OpenStack environment. You have Keystone credentials, and you have the ability to like interact with resources there. Apart from the word that your public cloud provider or general cloud provider gives you, how can you find out what OpenStack version you're running on? Anyone? Well, call Monty is an option, sure. If he's not on a plane or... Uh, Monty might not answer if he's busy discussing US politics with me. That's your, your only limitation there. No, but really, how, like, how, how, do, I, how do I answer that? What OpenStack am I running on? How to do that? It's actually really simple. Uh, you fire up a virtual machine, you fire up a Nova instance, and then you log into this thing, and then you run DMI decode. Um, and it will tell you what OpenStack it's running on, and it will actually give you the Nova version uh, that is being, uh, that's, that's running on the compute node that your machine is running on, your VM is running on, right? Um, and uh, of course, you know, that those may differ between individual compute nodes in that cloud environment, but it's actually really helpful. For some bizarre reason, it upcases the UUID of your of your a VM and just uses an, an uppercase or capitalized version of that, but um, it's reasonably helpful. So if you want to verify whether your cloud service pride is actually running the uh, specific version that they tell you they're running, this is how you find out. You just run DMID code as root in the VM. Um, a second thing that a lot of people apparently don't know about is how to really quickly configure an instance on initial boot up uh, with cloud config. So many of you may be familiar with uh, Nova user data. So if you do OpenStack server create, there's a thing, there's an option that you can set called user data. There's also an equivalent of doing that in Horizon. And uh, very frequently, you see people uh, write user data scripts that you look like this. So it's basically like a, it's a shell script, and then there's something that you want to do with the, with the machine, something that I generally call a fraudnication, right? And, uh, and then you're done. Please don't do this. Uh, this is a really, really bad idea to initialize VMs on startup because, or initial boot up, because you're probably inventing a lot of wheels that you don't need to invent. Instead, what you ought to be using is you should be using the cloud config syntax to user data. Uh, that's a very simple text-based YAML syntax that you pass in with user data. You can do that on the Nova or OpenStack server command line or via Horizon or from a heat template or whatever. And you can do an awful lot of things that otherwise you would have to painstakingly script yourself if you took the shell script approach. Um, 
Like, for example, suppose you wanted to, which is generally a good idea to do, when you fire up your VM for the first time, your Nova instance for the first time, you want to ensure that all the packages that are installed on that thing are the latest versions of whatever is available from your distro vendor, so you catch security fixes and patches and so forth. If you were to do this from a shell script, you would first need to detect what is the, either you run a different shell script for every platform, like for every OS that you run, or you have to, you'd have to detect, like, am I running on SUSE, in which case I use Zipper, or I'm on CentOS or Fedora, in which case I use Yum, except it's like Fedora 26 or later, then I need to use DNF, and if it's a Debian or Ubuntu box, I need to use apt and blah, 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 blah. It's much nicer to just set like two Boolean variables. So in your cloud config, looks like this, cloud config, package up, up, update true, package upgrade true, that's it, right? Machine boots up, does a complete update of all, of all system packages. Uh, perhaps you want to configure certain users or groups in your system. You had a question. You have a cloud config question in general. OK, fair enough. Um, so I'll, I'll get to you in a second. So you can configure uh, users and groups, right? So you can, uh, you can create a few non-default users, stick them into specific groups, do this and that, use a, set a password for them, et cetera. So a bunch of things that you can do there with users. There's a simple Boolean that enables or disables uh, SSH password authentication. So you could just use SSH PW auth equals true. You can use write files to drop arbitrary files into this thing. Like, for example, you might want to roll out a custom host file or something. And then you can also do a little more complex things with them uh, because there are cloud init modules. There's actually cloud init, the service that boots up when, uh, that starts when the, when the machine boots and it detects whether it's being booted for the first time. And then it does these things and there are, uh, there's a multitude of modules that CloudInit supports. Some of them are very easy or simple, like the ones that just drops a file into a prescribed location with certain permissions and a, and a specific content. But some are a little more complex. So for example, suppose you maintain the configuration of all your virtual machines with Puppet. There's a thing called Puppet. Right? There's a cloud init module called Puppet, and you, d you configure it with, here's where my Puppet master is, and this is the CA certificate that it should accept, and then it will do everything else that it needs to do, that is install the Puppet agent packages, and configure it, and fire it up, and, and so on. Uh, maybe you're using Chef, uh, and then there's something for that as well. There is the ability to just generically install packages, so you can just give it a list of additional packages that you want to install. Say, for example, all of your VMs should be running Ansible and Git, then that's just a, a YAML list that you can put in there. And uh, like I said, pretty much a myriad of different options that are available, different modules that are supported from CloudInit. But even if you run out of functionality from CloudInit, if there's something that you absolutely need to do, that there isn't a cloud init module for, or a cloud config module for. You also have the ability to either use boot command, that's running a command early in the boot sequence. Um, like for example, maybe you want your server to, first of all, before it does anything else, get a time from, from NTP or something like that. Or you can also do run command, which you can use to run commands late in the boot sequence. So like at the very end, uh, after all other modules are done, run command simply executes a handful of scripts that, uh, that, you, that you define. So very simple, super useful, uh, something that you should totally use if you need to do any kind of initial boot up configuration from OpenStack uh, and don't want to write your shell scripts. Spoiler, you really don't want to write shell scripts for this purpose, right? Just to have it said, CloudInit is actually not OpenStack specific. It works really well in OpenStack, but it also works in CloudStack, and it works in AWS, and it even works on something that doesn't run in a cloud, as long as a machine that boots has a disk image or a, an attached disk that's either, what is it, either VFAT or ISO 9660 and is named CI data, then you can, it will just parse that information when CloudInit boots. What else can we do? Uh, another handy little trick is uh, how you as a cloud uh, operator, an OpenStack operator, can ensure that your users can spin up 
instances, that is virtual machines, uh, really, really fast. So, and I, I want to take a moment to talk about the importance of, of fast instance spin-up really quickly. Uh, so, so frequently, a lot of people would think, well, it doesn't really make a whole lot of a difference if spinning up an, an over instance takes one minute or 10. Uh, but, and that may be true for a lot of use cases, but you should be aware that there absolutely are scenarios where instance spin-up is a factor, and that is generally true under any circumstances where you're aiming for something that actually deserves the moniker of scalability and elasticity. So if you simply have a use case where uh, within a very short amount of time, you absolutely need to spin up 100 instances in order to stem your uh, your heightened workload, then it absolutely makes a big difference of whether we're taking 30 seconds to do something or five minutes or 10. Now, uh, how is uh, Ceph really interesting and really helpful in this regard? Well, the good thing about Ceph and its OpenStack integration is it is one storage backend that you can plug into a multitude of, of OpenStack services. And not only can you plug it into a number of OpenStack services, they will actually collaborate and communicate with each other because there are certain Ceph-specific optimizations in the services. So you can use Ceph as a backend for glance image storage. You can use it as a backend for Cinder volumes. And you can use it as a backend for Nova storage, both for boot from volume, that simply means reusing the Cinder storage capacity, but also for Nova ephemeral, ephemeral storage. So that means that you can um, create ephemeral virtual machines, ephemeral instances in Nova that will have Ceph RBD backed disk images created on demand when they fire up and they will be destroyed when the machine dies, when the VM dies, the instance dies. Now, in Ceph parlance, this maps to what Ceph calls RBD or RADOS block device. Now, a RADOS block device is a device that behaves just like a regular block device. So it has, it has a, a, a defined sector or block size. It has a defined length. Writing, and writing to and reading from the device are really simple operations. You simply define an offset address, and then uh, you have a memory buffer of a certain length, and you read that much from the device. Voila, that's your read. And Conversely, a write is, is equally simple. Now, what RBD does is, under the covers, some magic happens that turns this block I.O. into the creation, modification, or deletion of uh, RADOS objects. That is to say, objects in the distributed object store that Ceph uses. And like many other block device types, uh, RBD is capable of creating and managing snapshots. A snapshot is a, is a consistent and in Ceph parlance, always read-only view of the block device at any arbitrary point in time. Or a clone, and a clone is an efficient and writable exception store uh, to a snapshot, or less technically speaking, just a writable snapshot. And in OpenStack, we can use both of those. You can use the snapshots and the clones essentially left, right, and center. So for example, if we do a boot from image, so just a regular ephemeral boot, of a Nova instance, then what can happen if both of these services, namely Glance and Nova, are RBD backed, we, we operate on an image that is stored in Glance, more precisely, a snapshot of that image, and then we create a Nova RBD clone. So rather than Nova having to stream the image down to a compute node, creating a local copy that is then only locally being cached, and firing up a new instance, Nova can just talk to Ceph in the back end and say, I now need a clone of this specific snapshot. And that is practically instantaneous. So that is basically sub-second snapshots and sub-second cloning compared to potentially having to wait for several minutes for, say, a 200 gigabyte image to be streamed down to a compute node, right? So that's a massive, uh, a massive win here as far as the, the, the spin-up time is concerned. The same thing happens if we're doing boot from volume. Uh, if Cinder is Ceph RBD back, then we can, we can clone from a glance snapshot into a Cinder RBD clone and then just boot from that. 
The same thing when we are creating an image from a volume, that is to say we create a new image that is initialized with, um, with, um, with volume data. Normally that means pulling the data out of one store, piping it into the other, takes forever. Whereas if we do this in Ceph, it's a practically instantaneous operation. And the same thing is true when we're doing volume snapshots or creating a volume from an image. That is to say, initialize a volume with, uh, with some image content. So the reverse of the operation that I described previously. And if we're putting everything in Ceph, then that means, as I said, there is absolutely no image streaming that is necessary at any given time. And uh, we can do all of these storage operations in the background and uh, in the back end, and that makes it a lot faster. There is one thing that you do need to keep in mind, both as a user and as an operator, which is that all of these optimizations, namely all of this sort of cloning in the back end and so on, those only happen if you store your images in glance in the raw storage format, as opposed to the default QCOW2. Now, the reason why you want to be forced to use raw images, I think, is relatively straightforward. QCOW2 is a file format that, create, that, that has support for copy and write, for an exception store, for snapshots, and so on. Whereas if you do all of that in the file format that you then store essentially as a dumb image in Ceph, then you're completely foregoing the corresponding features in Ceph itself, and you want to use the latter because they're faster, better, whatever. So that then raises the next question. How do I convert images in Glance from one format to another? Right? Because if you have, say, for example, a compressed uh, image in QCOW2, it may be something like, I don't know, 200 megabytes in size. If you were to uh, decompress that and uh, then convert it into raw, it might easily explode to several gigabytes, and then uploading several gigabytes into like a public cloud can take a while, right? That's something where you might want to look for shortcuts. So suppose you have an image in Glance, it's in the wrong format. So for example, you or your cloud service provider may have uploaded an image in the QCOW2 format, but because you realize you would be in much better shape if you could use um, Ceph backend cloning and snapshots, you want to convert it to raw. Normally, that means you have two options. One, you download the image, convert it, in play, uh, convert it um, locally, and then re-upload it. Takes forever. And then there's also a super extremely arcane task flow syntax to do this in the Glance backend, but that's really terrible, and I'm about to show you a really easy way, uh, which is it's a two-step process, but everything happens within the cloud, including your public cloud, if it's a public cloud that you're interacting with, which is you create a volume from an image, and what then implicitly always happens is that the volume is being converted to the raw format if the volume is ceph -backed. And then you create an image again from the volume, and that always preserves the volume format. So now you, 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 you took it from QCOW to raw, and then from raw to raw, and voila, you have an image that has the correct, um, the, the, the correct format, right? Uh, which is like a super stupid trick, but it works. Um, okay, um, another thing that a lot of people either don't know about or, or, or sort of misunderstand a lot is uh, availability zones, okay? Because uh, availability zones in OpenStack, they've, they've existed for a while. They have a little bit of a bad reputation for historical reasons, which at this point is really rather undeserved. But you should be aware of what they can be used for, and, and how exactly they work. So what are AZs? What are availability zones? Um, Availability zones are meant to divvy up either your or your public cloud provider's compute environment into failure domains. So that means that by operating an availability zone or multiple availability zones, a cloud provider makes a statement 
that roughly goes like if you're running resources in one availability zone and there is an outage that is affecting that availability zone, then resources that you choose to run in other availability zones will be unaffected by the same outage. Okay, so if, if I have a, an availability zone over here and everything burns down, then I, as a cloud service provider, am still saying, well, all of the resources that are running in other AZs are fine. And therefore, if you have an application that requires high availability, um, you would be smart to have either an HA strategy or a disaster recovery strategy from one AZ to the other. What are AZs not? AZs are not three things. They are not host aggregates. Uh, host aggregates are for grouping compute nodes by specific characteristics. So for example, uh, something that, a, a, uh, that you might group uh, host aggregates by is you have a handful of compute nodes that have GPU support that can be directly PCI passed through into VMs, or um, compute nodes that are hooked up to an InfiniBand fabric that, again, with PCI pass-through and SRIOV, you would make available to VMs, to instances. Um, any compute node can be in uh, zero or more host aggregates, whereas it can only ever be in one availability zone. Right? So that's kind of the, the distinction between those two. AZs are also not cells. Uh, Nova cells are for hierarchical scheduling in OpenStack environments with very large number of compute nodes. Um, AZs are essentially orthogonal to cells. Uh, so what cells do for you is if you have hundreds of thousands of cores, you want to have a, a hierarchical type of scheduling where at first you select the subset, you have a scheduler that selects a subset of your nodes, that's called the cell scheduler, and then within a cell you select a specific compute node for an instance uh, that you're running. So again, not the same as availability zones, but orthogonal to each other. And lastly, AZs are not regions. Uh, regions are separate OpenStack clouds in their own right, which are normally unified only by a single service catalog, a user authentication scheme, and possibly a global image store. Um, and as such, regions transcend the compute-only scope that is inherent to all of AZs and cells and host aggregate, um, and any region contain, can contain zero or more availability, actually one or more availability zones, because there's always a default AZ, uh, but any AZ can only ever be in a single region. Now, what supports availability zones? Availability zones are actually supported by a number of OpenStack services. So Nova supports them, that is specifically Nova Compute. Cinder supports them, that is specifically Cinder Volume. And Neutron supports them, specifically the gateway node agents, the L3 agent, the DHCP agent, LBAS agent, and so forth. There is a small but relatively important difference between Nova and Cinda on the one hand, and Neutron on the other hand, uh, which is that in Nova and Cinda, uh, when you create either an instance or a volume, you get to set exactly one availability zone. And if that availability zone is unavailable, meaning because of quota issues or because of resource starvation issues, you can't schedule or you can't fire up a, a, a Nova instance or a Cinder volume in the AZ that you want, the scheduling request just fails. Whereas in Neutron, AZs are actually a prioritized list. So you can, for, for Neutron scheduling, you can give more than one AZ and it will try one first and, and then the next and, and so on, right? So if one AZ is not available for, say, a router, then we'll try the next one. What's nice about AZs is that uh, when you interact with them, they kind of sort of follow each other. So that means that if you are firing up a VM in a specific uh, Nova availability zone and you make that VM boot from volume, uh, and a boot from volume that is that is initialized from an image, then the whole shebang is actually smart enough to detect that, oh, maybe you want your Cinder volume in the same AZ as well, 
right? And maybe you want to do the same thing with your routers that are associated with this thing. Now, there is one thing that is pretty important to sort of think about uh, when we are dealing with uh, AZs. And that is, as I mentioned, there's only a handful of OpenStack services, and not all of them, that, supports av that support availability zones in the first place. Uh, one service that knows nothing about availability zones is Glance. And so, therefore, um, there is an interesting challenge there. Uh, and that's a challenge that is addressed by the Cinder image volume cache. Now, admittedly, this is a bit obscure because it's, it's very u extremely useful in a very specific scenario. So consider this. Nova and Cinder uh, do support availability zones, and they actually play rather nicely with their mutual availability zone support. Um, and Glance does not, right? Glance knows nothing about AZs. So you could have a setup, a cloud setup, with multiple physical locations that looks roughly like this. You have a central location that has all your control nodes, so that those are your API endpoints that's shown in red. There is a teeny tiny uh, compute availability zone, which is called AZ0, in that central location. And then we have a couple more location on the left and on the right. And I only want to use those as, uh, as, as compute locations. And as it happens, in all of those, I have a separate existing storage hardware that I want to use. And in, th in this example, what I put is in the central location, I've got Ceph. And uh, let's say I have EMC storage in the, in the location on the left, and I have NetApp storage in the location on the right. And I want to use all those, right? And, uh, and, and, and here, so what we have here is multiple geographic locations. Each has compute nodes and each has storage. But only one location, the one in the center, has control nodes. And hence, that is the only one that can run Glance. So if an instance is fired up in one of the remote locations, like if what's, what's happening in the center is like dead straightforward, that's simple. But if we were firing up an instance in one of the remote locations, it would have to do one of two things. Either it would have to stream the image down to the remote location, specifically to the compute node, and would have to do so once for each image and for each compute node that that image is being deployed on. Um, that is, a, number one, it's a pretty bad waste of bandwidth. And number two, it means really, really slow instant spin up. Or, and that's the other option, it would have to assume that it has permanent access to the original image and then create sort of a shallow copy on write clone uh, from it. So that's normally what happens if both ephemeral Nova storage and Glance storage is in Ceph. Now that's easy on bandwidth. <laughs> because I'm not streaming down a whole lot of data, but it's absolutely terrible in terms of latency, and also I've got my EMC and my NetApp storage that suddenly I can no longer use. So that's kind of crap, right? I don't want to do that. And there's something that is super, super useful, and I can enable it with a single line of configuration in Cinder, and that is called Image Volume Cache Enabled. It defaults to false. If you set it to true, you can either set it true globally in your CinderCon, or you can set it for a specific backend. When I enable this, when I enable this Cinder, volume, uh, Cinder Image Volume Cache, Every time an image is used for the first time in an availability zone, it's streamed down into the Cinder backend for that AZ, and then a copy is created there. And every subsequent use of that image in that AZ then doesn't need to be fetched from the primary glance location, but it can simply be served from the image volume cache. And if my local backend is capable of doing fantasy things like snapshots and clones, then we can totally use that as well for any future instance spin up. Uh, and of course, you know, enterprise storage like EMC and NetApp and Huawei and whatever, they all do support that, right? So still, if I have a really large image and I fire it up in an availability zone for the first time, that's going to take a really long time. But any other future spin up of this is then really, really, really fast. And I get much better use out of my existing hardware. Um, I can either uh, just enable this, but I can also limit it 
um, like for example, I can say, if an image is over a certain size, I don't want to cache it. And I can also, this is basically an LRU cache, I can also limit the maximum amount of uh, images that, uh, I that are stored in the local cache. This is an exceedingly useful feature that requires almost no maintenance. It's just you flip it on and it just works and it kind of does what you, what you intuitively want it to do. So it's really, really cool. And for these setups, uh, it's super helpful because your alternative is simply to, rather than have just multiple AZs, to have multiple OpenStack regions and that's kind of overkill in this case. Number eight, uh, suspend and resume. Uh, the ability to suspend and resume instances, so virtual machines, um, is a very useful OpenStack feature, but it's important to understand what these actions do. You might think that if you launch the command against an instance OpenStack server suspend, instance name or UUID, you just suspend the server. That's not what happens. Okay, because most of the time when, you th when you're thinking like, what does it mean to suspend a virtual machine? Well, the virtual machine really runs in a QMU KVM user space process, so we send that process a sick stop. And when we resume, then we send it a sick cont, and that's it. That's not what happens. Um, instead, uh, and, and to confuse matters more, if in libvirt you do a verse suspend, that's exactly what libvirt does in suspension, but Nova is different. Uh, in in, in what, what suspend is, in Nova speak, compares to what libvirt calls a managed save operations. Um, the content of the virtual machine's memory is written to a file, and that's called a save file, and then the KVM instance is shut down. And when it starts back up, then it means that, uh, then libvirt sees, okay, there's a save file, fine, and so it fires up the, the, the VM, in a pause state, then copies in the, constant, uh, the content of the save file, and then resumes. So that means that for you as a public cloud user who is paying for CPU time and RAM hours, server suspend is almost free. Because during this time, you're, like when the machine is suspended, when the instance is suspended, it actually does not consume any si CPU cycles and RAM whatsoever. Uh, and because uh, CPU hours and RAM hours are clearly sort of the largest or the most important cost driver, um, the only thing that you're still going to pay be paying for is a disk allocation. And that's practically free, right? Um, and the, the, your, your cloud service provider will charge you for a few other things as well, such as you, know, you might have allocated a floating IP address uh, or something like that, right? But the lion's share of your cost is going to be from CPU time and RAM time, and that's, that's gone. So this is great for, like, for example, any test environments. You fire them up once, and then you do your testing, and then you suspend them, and then you bring them up again at a later date. But there is something that's even nicer than OpenStack Server Suspend, which is OpenStack Stack Suspend, where you can do the whole thing for an entire heat stack. So you have a, an, an arbitrarily complex environment described in a heat stack, whatever, 50 different servers and three different networks with any number of routers between them, and uh, it will do all of that for you, right? You say OpenStack stack suspend, all of the VMs suspend, you pay nothing until you go back to um, OpenStack stack resume, and that's that. What you can also do with heat, while we're talking about heat, is uh, stack snapshot and rollback. So you can do an OpenStack stack snapshot create, and it will, it will snapshot uh, all of your resources in the in the environment so that at a later date you can roll back to it. Again, this doesn't quite do what you think it does because you would think this creates a snapshot of every running Nova instance and a snapshot of every Cinder volume in the stack. What actually does is a bit different, which is yes, it does create a Nova snapshot, but what Heat Engine does instead of a volume snapshot is it actually takes a Cinder backup so it snapshots the volume and then creates a backup from it. The idea behind this is that snapshots are always tied to the volume. If you delete a volume, such as at the end of the lifetime of a stack, then its snapshots are also gone, whereas the backups survive. 
And so that means that if your cloud service provider actually has to run the Cinder backup service in order for heat stack snapshots to work. And there are a few limitations on that. Uh, the chief one is that if you're using any kind of nesting in your stack, that is to say uh, you make use of complex resource types or of resource groups, then very unfortunately the stack snapshot of the nested stack will be a no-op. That's really, really painful uh, in terms of user experience, really, because it doesn't do anything and then comes back successfully. Maybe not that great, right? Pretend, pretends to do something and then it doesn't. Number 10, nested virtualization. Also something that a lot of people don't know that it can do in OpenStack and fewer understand its limitations. Uh, nested virtualization means running KVM in KVM. So you're getting a Nova instance in a private or public cloud. And then within that, you're spinning up KVM instances. In KVM parlance, that's known as nested guests. And just to be clear, that means that you're running KVM virtual machines with hardware acceleration within something that itself runs in KVM. Um, the, the trivial thing is you can always run something with QMU because that doesn't use any hardware uh, uh, acceleration. There are a few things that you need to keep in mind though, which is uh, when you have running nested guests, you cannot suspend the, if you will, host VM, right? I'm talking about the host VM, that's the thing that runs in Nova, and then you have guest VM, that's the stuff that runs within it. Um, so you can't suspend uh, a KVM virtual machine that has other KVM children, if you will. That is, you can totally suspend it, but when it resumes, it's gonna kernel panic. Uh, this, has not, this is not a Nova limitation, this is an an inherent limitation in KVM. This is actually being worked on uh, upstream. Apparently, latest KVM versions can, uh, can nest virtualization up to four levels deep. But uh, in, it's quite likely that the KVM that you're running on your laptop or that your cloud service provider uh, is not a version that supports that uh, already. So you can, uh, there is no suspend for, for VMs that run, that while they're running nested guests, right? If they stop them and then, then you suspend them, that's fine. But that also means that you also cannot live migrate these VMs, right? So, because under the covers, live migration and suspension are really exactly the same thing. So, it, like the code path is exactly the same. It's a different type of file descriptor. Like suspend writes to a file, whereas live migration writes to a TLS encrypted BSD socket. Uh, so again, same thing. You can live migrate this thing, but then once the live migration is complete, it will promptly kernel panic. Um, so again, being worked on by the by the KVM developers, and 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 that's that. So uh, if you are if if this is a feature that you are enabling in your in the cloud that you're running, you need to tell your users. Uh, any time we choose to live migrate your VM, your VM is gonna die. And they need to cope with that, right? They can do like an auto reboot or whatever, uh, but, uh, but, but that's it. And if they want to suspend on their own volition, then they'd better shut down their virtual machines uh, first. While I'm at it, I should add one other thing or mention one other thing, which is what I talked about are all issues affecting VMs while they're running nested guests and then suspend and, and live migration becoming a problem. But what about live migration even for VMs that are not currently running nested guests? Now, in order to facilitate live migration, this by the way is the default configuration for CPU mode in Nova. Host model means that a virtual machine, a Nova instance that is started on this, on this compute node will see basically the exact same CPU flags and CPU features as the host has. And that creates, if this is the default, it's not a very smart default, but it's the default. And that creates issues when you live migrate between compute nodes of different processor architectures, right? Live migration can just break. Uh, again, this is a known issue in, in Libvirt and, and KVM, uh, 
I can't really think of a of a of a of a good of a good solution for that because if you're explicitly configuring it to like pass through all the features of the local CPU and then I live migrate somewhere else where the local CPU just doesn't have those features, then things are going to break. So something that a lot of OpenStack uh, cloud service providers and private cloud operators do is they override this default and they set CPU mode to custom and the CPU model to something that is a few years old, right? And it turns out that the Intel Ivy Bridge processor generation is a very popular uh, thing to choose. And until not so long ago, that was a perfectly fine choice until Meltdown happened. Or more precisely, the kernel patches mitigating Meltdown started to land because people then realized performance of virtual machines, specifically those in a nested virtualization context, absolutely tanked. And the reason for that was that the mitigation patches for Meltdown and to a certain extent Spectre rely on the availability of the processor context ID CPU flag. Guess what libvirt doesn't pass through by default with the Ivy Bridge model? PCID. Right? So that's not great. Luckily, we had a sort of an emergency patch by some Red Hat developers in the, what was it, uh, Rocky cycle, I think. I think it was this cycle. That um, we can now uh, explicitly define in our Nova configuration what CPU flags we want to pass through to our instances, to our VMs. And uh, we can set that with the CPU model flags option. And because this was all sort of kind of uh, relatively quickly you know, pushed out, they said, OK, we're going to play it completely safe. And the only thing that we're going to support in the back port, so that is to say the, in the patches that then went into Queens and Pike, the only CPU model flag that we're going to allow to pass through is just the processor context ID flag. Okay, so you can only do PC, PCID. It's a one-line patch. If you, if you actually must run Queens and you must support this and whatnot, it's a one-line patch to, 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 to the Nova, controller co uh, Nova Compute Code, and you can roll that out if, if you know what you're doing. But anyway. Um, and now, why am I mentioning this in the live migration context? Uh, I'm sorry, in the nested virtualization context, because that means the VMX flag, the thing that allows you to do nested virtualization doesn't get passed through, right? So that means that before Rocky, you either don't do, you don't allow nested virtualization, or you, uh, you run that one line patch, or you, um, uh, or you accept that, uh, that performance absolutely tanks, right? That's basically what it is. And now since Rocky, you can do the right thing finally, oh, or, the other option, like pre-Rocky, is also just pass do host model or host pass through. And since Rocky, what you can finally do is uh, set a CPU mode custom, CPU model, something like Ivy Bridge, and then override the CPU model flags to a comma-separated list. So for example, you might want to pass through PCID. That's what you always want to do, else your performance is going to go down the drain. And if you then also want to support nest virtualization, you also have to pass through the VMX flag. Hmm? And then finally, I have one other thing just because it's cool. Um, it's probably not something that you're going to ever want to use, but I still want to m wanted to mention it because I had it in the talk description. That's instance auto expiry, all credit to the fine folks at CERN because they came up with this. Um, and that is a way to automatically reap uh, instances that have been running for a long time and that someone uh, just forgot about, right? Uh, this requires Mistral. Uh, that's a workflow execution engine. It does come as part of the OpenStack code base. Your public cloud service provider or private cloud deployment engine may or may not make it available to you. There is some assembly required if you want to run Mistral, and that is a bit of an understatement uh, because there is one production-ready way that you can, you can deploy Mistral, and that is through a Puppet module. Again, CERN, big puppet shop, and uh, again, all, all credit to them for that support. Um, if you're running on, um, on, a, on an Ubuntu Juju environment, there is a Juju charm for Mistral, but unfortunately, that one hasn't seen a whole lot of love in about two years. So 
your mileage may vary when deploying that, but basically what you do is you make a reasonably clever use of instance properties. We can set arbitrary uh, instance metadata properties in, uh, in for any Nova instance. In this case, uh, they use something that they call um, expire, and then they have a date, right? And then they use YAML. YAML is, of course, yet another query language, and you can you can select uh, these things, and you basically select across all of your VMs, uh, all of your Nova instances in all of your projects, the ones that actually have this expiry set, and then you have this absolutely massive mistral workflow that not only actually goes through your environment and kills off these VMs that, uh, that are set to expire, but is actually being nice and two weeks earlier, like two weeks before that, sends the appropriate CERN scientist that owns this thing a nice email, we're about to nuke your thing and so forth. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty clever and neat. If you want to look into this in a little more detail, uh, I highly recommend, I generally highly recommend the OpenStack in production blog from, from CERN. Uh, this is the short link to the very article that describes this. Okay, and uh, I am almost out of time. Before I go to questions, all these slides are up on GitHub. They are under a Creative Commons attribution share alike license. If you find them useful, if you want to use them, please do so. Uh, as you see fit. And, sir, you had a question about users and Cloud Config, if I remember correctly, or something with Cloud Config. Uh, I've been playing with the Cloud in it, and, and one problem I ran into was the f you were talking about, you know, what version of Nova am I running? And mm. I ran into a problem of what version of cloud in it am I running? Mm. That there's been a lot of changes of syntax, and, and I, I, especially when it came to the stuff that I was playing with, I think it was networking stuff actually that, that I want. But is there a way of, of you know, knowing what version of, of cloud in it I'm, I'm running? Because the problem I had was that some stuff was working on in some environments, and some stuff just silently was ignored in so another. in 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 my experience cloud in it actually has to has been trying to be backward compatible to a fault that is to say like they they as they keep adding new features they retain old syntax and old features even if there is a better way and even if there's if the old way is broken so something what 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 can totally happen is that you uh, you see a, a recipe for how to do something in cloud in it and the, the cloud init version that you're running is actually too old. Um, one of the things that you can see, even in, in public cloud service providers, um, some of them are not exactly particularly diligent in fixing up their uh, public glance images to the latest point releases of the various, um, uh, of, of the various uh, versions that they support, right? Uh, by the way, uh, for cloud operators, there is a new feature in Rocky, which uh, is that you can hide images. So uh, previously, we could only deprecate them, and we could delete them, but deletion wasn't possible if there were any VMs or any instances still using it. So now we have this thing where an old image can actually be hidden from the, from the glance image list. Um, and so you sometimes run into the problem that, say, for example, your Ubuntu 16.04 version that is available from your public cloud provider um, has an old or outdated cloud in it. So, for example, if I remember correctly, uh, Ubuntu 16.04.2 um, had no support whatsoever for cloud in it if your VM, if your instance, was IPv6 only, so it didn't have an IPv4 address. wasn't dual stack, wasn't IPv4 only, was IPv6 only. Um, and then they fixed that in 16.04.3, if my memory serves me right. And that puts you in a catch-22 because, uh, you know, cloud in it is sort of broken in the image, and it takes cloud in it to actually do a package upgrade, right? And then, unfortunately, your only real option is to just take a newer image and upload it uh, or or fetch it from the from the Ubuntu uh, cloud images server, or coax your cloud service provider into 
maybe after a year and a half, you'd like to uh, fix up the, the, the Ubuntu cloud image, right? That would be helpful. Mm. More questions? Yes, Monty. Oh, my God. It's a, it's a simple one, I think. Ah. Uh, on the suspend, uh, in your suspend stuff, yeah. so it writes it to the, the memory file, to, and then you resume. Mm. What happens if, the, if that compute host is full? Ha! Excellent question. So um, what happens with, uh, the, with this suspend image? So basically, the, 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 the RAM image that has to be stored somewhere. Uh, it goes into a hard-coded location. I think it is var blip libvirt, QMU, whatever, and uh, the likes of OpenStack, Ansible, and friends then symlink that somewhere else, like symlink that into varlib nova under the presumption that that might be NFS mounted and, and what have you. But nova itself like, doesn't give a flip about these and doesn't account for them at all. Nova generally does not account at all for, um, it doesn't treat suspended VMs in any way especially. So if you have a compute node that is completely fully scheduled, but all the, all the instances there are suspended, so the effective CPU and RAM utilization is zero, then the Nova scheduler still won't schedule anything there. So actually, Tobias took that uh, to, the, to the PTG. Uh, I mean, what I would love to see is I'd, I'd, I'd love to be able to configure in Nova a factor um, which would default to one of how to count suspended um, count the 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 the, the v cores and the RAM of suspended VMs for like scheduling utilization. Uh, but those are those things are all unaccounted for. Like what what happens with CPU utilization, or RAM utilization that of of instances that are suspended, and also it doesn't care at all about um, the suspend files itself. That, by the way, is a big caveat if you're running all of your um, OpenStack uh, Ceph backed and you think that your compute nodes can therefore be practically diskless. Because you might have like a whatever eight gigabyte var file system, and then you can slam that by suspending a single VM that just happens to have like eight gigabytes of RAM uh, utilized. Uh, one possible workaround for that, if you're running Ceph already, is just mount that varlib save directory from CephFS, and then the problem evaporates because then suddenly you know it's no longer stored locally, but. Uh, the, yes, the accounting uh, for that in, in Nova is, is rather bad. This is not, it's not wonderful. And also, we have very few alternatives. Like, for example, uh, there is no way to, if you, have a, if you have a heat stack, there is no way to shut down the entire stack. You can delete it, you can nuke the whole thing, but you can't say, well, what I'd really like to do is I'd like for the heat engine to cycle through all of the instances there and just do a Nova stop on them. Right, we we just can't do that. There is there is no action no in the heat engine. There is no resource action called stop and start. We can we can create, we can delete, and then we can suspend. But that's it. Yeah, it's not great, but uh, it's still. I mean, to heat's credit, uh, it's still. This is something that, to the best of my knowledge, uh, neither EC2 nor Azure nor uh, nor the Google Compute platform can do. Like they just don't, if, if you, I mean, Azure doesn't have anything remotely related to heat, but AWS CloudFormation, it basically, yeah, you can create it and then you can delete it. And, and the same thing is true for Google, it's called, I think the, the Google Cloud Platform Deployment Manager or some weird uh, name like that. And it also cannot do that. This is like just a heat only feature, the ability to just suspend and resume entire stacks. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. You were first? You were first? I'm not sure. You're, you're closer here. If you don't mind, sir, we'll, we'll take generally. Yeah, short, short question regarding the suspend and resume. So you mentioned that we nested KVM. Do you see any problem with doing that in, let's say, containerized uh, VMs like, or that you're running Docker on it and you do suspend and then resume? Do you see any problem? No, no, no. Oh. That's, it, it's, it's, it, that is only a problem that has to do with, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the kernel hardware accelerated 
um, uh, VM that, uh, virtualization that is provided by the KVM Intel and KVM AMD modules. Um, you, you're, you're not going to run into any kind of issue like that if uh, what you're running is containers, and you're not going to run into any kind of issue when you're doing quote unquote virtualization, but with QMU as opposed to KVM. So QMU without hardware acceleration is perfectly fine. That can suspend, resume, live migrate, everything. Uh, yes, please. Is there any downside to having the Glance image caching turned on by default? Is and there, not, uh, wait, is there a downside to having the Glance image cache turned on by default? There isn't really a downside, but if all you have is a single region, it's potentially useless. Because if, if, you, can, if you can access like your Glance data just as quickly as the data from your Cinder, then possibly that might just be a waste of storage. But if you're saying, well, no, I really want to, uh, I, 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 I really want all of my VM related storage on say my EMC or my Hitachi or, or NetApp and, and whatnot, then I really can't I think I guess the question is, is it a sane default really? Oh. Well, let's not necessarily get into a discussion about sane defaults because we won't be done by midnight. Um, but uh, uh, it is, it, I, yes, it is, it is a sane default in the sense that um, uh, there are a couple of other things that are also required um, that for which there is no default. So, so Cinder has to be configured. Uh, with uh, with a uh, with a uh, with a specific uh, with specific tenant credentials uh, to actually interact with Glance, basically interacting as a Glance client, and there is no way to just sort of predict that. So that's in, in that sense, I think yes, it's a it's a sane it's a sane default. I, I, yeah, I'm not gonna second guess that. Okay. Any other questions? Any more? Um, no. I think I'm I'm actually right on. Thirsty. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, all right. Well then. So thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Yeah.